The following podcast is being brought to you by the Defy Life Podcast Network. Welcome to Aftergate, powered by the Defy Life Network. Are y'all ready? Aftergate is a podcast series highlighting Colgate alumni of color in their professional endeavors, Aftergate. Are y'all ready? Aftergate is hosted by Alvin Glimpf, a.k.a. Al, and Herman Dubois, a.k.a. Jerry. Are y'all ready? We are doing Aftergate because Colgate University has produced innovators who have changed the world every day, yet many alumni of color and the mainstream Colgate community are unaware of the amazing accomplishments of alums of color. Are y'all ready? Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is another episode of Aftergate. And I am Alvin Glimpf, co-host. It is an honor to be here. Always enjoy these conversations. So looking forward to this one as well. Let me introduce my co-host, Mr. Herman Dubois. What's going on, brother? How you doing? What's good? What's good? All is well. You know, early morning sessions are always special, you know, kind of. Different, first, right? Very first different. First break, yeah, yeah, yeah. I realize our, our night, our night uh, interviews and our and our morning day interviews, you just got different kind of energies. All good, just you know, mm-hmm. a different kind just of different. flow. You know, uh, still, still life, life in paradise is good. You know, uh, got a beautiful sunrise and then some palm trees. So you know, yeah, can't really, yeah, yeah. can't really uh, ask for much more. Just appreciate and be, you know, gratuitous and and, and gracious about the blessings we have. All, all good. And speaking of blessings, it was a blessing to see you last weekend. Um, yes, sir. Very definitely appreciate it. Always being in your presence. Um, but and let's be and, let, and let, let's be let's be clear. My, no, my presence was was made possible by opportunities through the network to 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 not only vibe and 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 have some genuine time together of engagement, but to also take care of business and, and do the work we do to serve communities and and just you know align some of our resources, our abilities, our talents. And, and be impactful and moving the needle to change the lives of uh, of, of our communities. And I think that, uh, you know, that's probably powerful in and of itself because as, as uh, our guest this, uh, this interview will, will indicate that, you know, it's one thing to talk about it, it's another thing to be about it. And it's, 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 it's amazing to be able to be about the work that we talk that we, about what we do. Well said, well said, well said. Looking forward to further growth because actually that is what Aftergate is all about, leveraging those resources and connecting, right? So for those who don't know, and this might be your first time listening because we've been getting a lot of publicity and momentum and you might have just jumped on the bandwagon or you might just be here because you want to hear uh, our amazing guest because he's a popular dude in itself, right? So you might have just slid through to check him out. Aftergate is a podcast with the purpose of lifting up the stories of some of Colgate's amazing alumni. Uh, Alumni of color that have walked over the campus, done great things while they were there. And this is also about what have they done since they've graduated. So glad to have our listeners, glad to be doing this with my co-host and always glad to hear from our guests. Ready to bring them in? Let's do it, let's do it. Looking forward to uh, wrapping with this brother. Okay, okay, okay. So officially, let's welcome to the Aftergate podcast, class of 1991, Mr. Devin Hughes. So what's up, man? What's going on? Hey, y'all. Thanks for having me. Super excited to be here on this fabulous Saturday morning it is, huh? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. And, 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 and let's not just, you know, overlook the fact that Saturday mornings are different across the country. So where, where, where are you calling in from, D? I'm calling in from SoCal, sunny San Diego, California. Exactly. Oh, wow. Uh-huh. And wow. Al, where, where are you checking in from? I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. Yes, Fayetteville, to be exact, but uh, ATL. And I'm in Miami. So we got East Coast, West Coast going on here. So I appreciate, you know, Brother, taking the time to squeeze us in in the early, early right. morning a Saturday, no especially after, you know, a week of ripping and running and traveling across the country. So um, ecstatic about, you know, the intentionality. And, and I think it's because he just brings a lot to the table. And so we're happy to, you know, host him this this early morning. The little, little cafe, little cafecito instead of a little, <clears throat> you know, 
evening cocktails. It is, it, it is a different vibe, right? Because on so, some interviews, we might be sipping something else that's brown. <laughs> All together, all, all, all completely so, keeping it wholesome. <laughs> but today is a different vibe. Today is a different vibe. And that's all good. That's all good. That's all good. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we also do with the show is that before we get into the formalities of the interviews, is we kind of reference a little bit about maybe what was our first point of engagement oh, with the guest, yeah, no if, doubt. No if no we doubt. had one, because we've had guests that this is the first time we're meeting them and just have heard about them or never heard about them, and then there's those that we're like, "Yo, can you recall?" Good catch, good catch. Right, 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 right. And so, with, with that being said, uh, I, obviously, I what I could recall as one of the first times of my interactions with 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 our guest uh, Devin was um, in the gymnasium, uh, where mm. you know it was summertime and you know didn't really vibe with no one yet, and uh, was still figuring out who was who. But I knew I was gonna go find the gym and be able to shoot in Huntington, and I get there and. D was, you know, kind of shooting around with a couple other cats. And I didn't know at the time really much about the Kogay basketball program. I didn't know that he was a big recruit and that, you know, he had an illustrious career to get to Kogay. And there were big expectations for, for, for Devin at Kogay with the basketball program and a couple of other cats that were also freshmen. And, uh, you know, of course, I'm coming out the Bronx. You know, I, I walk up to basketball courts anywhere in the park and be like, yo, what's up? Like, you know, give me the rock. Or I'm bringing my own rock. And I'm just starting <laughs> to shoot in the mix, right? And D, so I'm walking up. And, like, there was a little bit of, like, on some, like, yo, you know what court you coming on. So, like, you know when you're in the project and you got, like, the court where the big guys play and then you got the little court where the little cats play. And the little cats don't really go to the big court because they know that they're not going to be taken seriously on the big man court. So that's how I felt when I walked up to the court. They, they all looked at me like, yo, you like, you know who you shooting with like this, we, we just, you know, it's an intramural gym, right. And this is for the entire <laughs> student body, but, but like, nah. And so I still shot around. And then, then I realized, you know, uh, okay. got to know, got to know the cat. And, and of course from there, it was just, it was cool. And he was a funny cat. He was always talking a lot oh, yeah. of smack, you know, on the court, off the court, just, you know, a witty cat. And so no doubt, you, had, no doubt. you had to bring your A game when you were going to talk with you because you didn't know if he was insulting you or complimenting you at the same time, you know? <laughs> so it's funny you it's funny you remember that because our uh, connection goes back to that summer, right? Oh, you we were 87, all in summer 87. Summer of 87. And like the basketball players who were part of that program yeah, literally football. were the, no, 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 no but they were the first basketball players, real basketball players oh, okay. that I ever played basketball with, right? So I came up there thought not thinking I could hoop until I was like playing, like pick up with these cats. And I'm like, oh, this is basketball. Yeah, yeah. Like, this is D1 oh, recruits. Right, this is the difference. <laughs> right? um, but no, nah, no, nah, to your point, real good cat. Um, definitely uh, remember doing some good hanging out and bonding that summer, right? Like that yeah. was a nice way to come to campus knowing a crew of people already that you have already kind of connected with. So definitely, definitely great memory. Great memory, Jerry. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now <laughs> let's take it a D and talk about what was happening in that time frame in the mid eighties, when you're getting ready to graduate high school, what's happening in the world politically, socially, where are you at? You know, what's your outlook on what's next for, for Devin Hughes at 18 going to Colgate? Class of 91, you graduate high school in 1987. So take us back, like from your memory, what's going on in your life in 1987 before you get to Colgate? What's the world like? What's what's going on in your world? Yeah, so I uh, I went to military high school, all boys. Uh, I had some disciplinary issues uh, when I was a youngster, and so my parents were prudent enough to thought that maybe I needed to change zip codes like yeah. <laughs> uh because maybe maybe a lot like y'all growing up I grew up in an environment where you know uh, you just weakness was perceived um in a certain way and so uh I'm light-skinned my father's African-American uh had the good hair green eyes growing up in certain places and certain cats would try to take advantage of that or try to perceive it as a weakness. That being said, I was just quick to let people know on Front Street that, that you know, that, that wasn't on the menu. I'm not the one. <laughs> I'm not the one. <laughs> now I might get, you know, sometimes I might lose sometimes, but I wasn't. So the point of the story was not to, 
not to suggest anything other than my, my parents thought public school probably wasn't the right place for me. Mm. So I ended up in military high school, a Catholic school, Catholic and military. So I, was little, I would say the our father before class and then go out in the hall and get inspection on my shoes, my uniform, no earrings, just all that. Mm. So, so, and then I'd have drill after school. We'd march around the field with some dude yelling orders at us like it was West Point. <laughs> but so that's a little bit of the backstory. Yeah, I end up loving it though, which is fascinating now that I look back. I mean, discipline, it's amazing when you when you know it, you don't know what you don't know. Right. 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 And then and so, you know, I was hanging out with cats who uh weren't talking about college, weren't talking about dreams and goals and aspirations. They were just talking about you know tomorrow. Mm-hmm. But when you change your environment, at least me. And you're hanging around, dude, the conversations change, right? People are talking about things you're not used to. And then you, and I think what happened to me when I went to high school up and I'm going to push forward here, I started to see myself differently. When people are talking about going to Morehouse or University of Maryland or wherever, I'm like, well, damn, I'm in that, I'm in that same dude's class. I'm just as smart as he is. That said, I, my parents didn't have a whole lot. I mean, neither parent, I'm a first generation college student. Mom had me when she was 18. Pops dropped dropped out of high school when he was in ninth grade. So basketball was my way out. I knew if I was going to go to college, it had to be with The Rock. Financially, we just weren't going to be able to do it. And my parents did not navigate. So I was all in on basketball, was in a good program, had done well, had an opportunity, had a few choices. Uh, Amongst all that craziness, though, my parents knew, and I kind of sort of knew I wasn't going pro. So if I was going to play D1, I might as well try to go to a good school. And a classmate of mine, two years ahead of me, went to Colgate, that you both know, Dave Crittenden. Yep. I did not know that. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So so Dave Crittenden, I went to the same high school. He was two years ahead of me. It's a DC thing. It's a DC thing. (laughs) Yeah. And so things just kind of triangulate. I didn't recruit Colgate. They recruited me. Maybe it's because of Dave. I don't know. Lo and behold, it it just ended up. And then I ended up that summer of 87 with y'all up on campus and that's that's how I ended up at Colgate. That's what's good. I any I, I did not know that at all. Like I remember you being from DC and from the area. Mm-hmm. Can you hear me now? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're back, you're back, yeah. Um I didn't know y'all all just forgot that y'all went to school together. But yeah, yeah. David ended up being pivotal guy that was part of um the journey there in terms of mentorship and like a big brother uh he was dating ruthie when we was at mm-hmm. spanish house Ruth, so, Ruth Chepe. and, uh, and, and, and so taking a step further so david was my when i was a freshman in hrc living in a in those those suites there that i had uh i was one of the few blessed uh freshmen that had a non-student of color roommate uh, uh-huh. which presented certain challenges and david was the upperclassman in the single room attached on the other side of the restroom and was dating ruth chapay so i felt like my freshman year i spent more time with ruth and david than i did with my own roommate um and that's how actually i knew david's story about uh his, his experience at the military high school and coming to Kogi and mm. what that mm. was like um but but devin uh so you coming out with that mindset, what, what, what do you think was, was, what, you know, expectation wise coming to Colgate with what was happening in the world and on the more macro, like talk about what was, what was going on in DC for you personally, socially, emotionally, besides the, you know, your family, you know, what, what was, where did Colgate play into that long-term? Yeah. You know, as I look back, right. Uh, I was so underprepared for Colgate. I mean, I was relatively, I guess, bright. I mean, I, I kind of coasted through high school. I did enough to get by. Uh, so I didn't take education. Education was a conduit to me, but I didn't take it that uh-huh. seriously. I treated it more like like the DMV, getting your driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you go yeah. through the class to get the outcome, uh-huh. but you're not really emotionally invested. That's how I treated education. I did just enough to get to where I needed to go. It was almost kind of like riding a subway in New York City. I just was riding around <laughs> doing high school. <laughs> Can it, connect you know what I'm saying? Occasionally you get off and you're like, oh, okay. And then you get back on. <laughs> Where am I going? That's okay. kind of what high school felt like. In the macro environment, though, DC was a fun place. I love DC, grew up. Um, you know, in terms of the environment, uh, you know, I don't remember a whole lot. I mean, I was kind of in my own world. I mean, between, to be honest, uh, I stayed in a bubble, so to speak, um, for the most part. 
uh, tried to stay out of trouble uh, at that certain point because I had some people along the way whisper in my ear that if I was going to play Division One basketball, I needed to start making some better choices. And finally, I started to listen. So I changed a little bit my circle. Um, and someone said to me something that stuck stick. And I don't remember who it was, but they said to me, and I remember this, I still remember this. They said, I said, young man, if the people in your inner circle are not talking about goals and dreams and aspirations and hope and faith and love, young man, you don't have a circle. You got a cage. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's deep right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that hits too. And that hit me like a, I mean, that hit me like a thunderbolt. And so I started evaluating who I'm hanging out with. And I noticed that the conversations were different. And so by, well, that point of that story that, you know, around sophomore year or something, I started to make some, you know, some different choices. I was still friends with cats, but I just wasn't as available. Right, 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 right. And so, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, that's what I end up doing. So in the macro environment, I mean, it was, you know, like a normal high school kids doing what we do, trying to float around, trying to figure out who I could be. I did notice, uh, you know, if, if you don't mind, I get a little bit personal. I had a lot of dysfunction at the house. Both of my parents had addiction issues. I didn't put that on Front Street at Colgate, but I wanted to get out. Mm. You know, uh, mom had a drug problem. Uh, dad was an alcoholic. Dad had this tendency to put his hands on mom when he drank too much. Mm. Uh, so I had a lot of, man, I had a lot of pain in the household. So part of my journey to figure out who I could be was like, I got to get up out of here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I yeah, felt, yeah. but I, but I felt torn because when you, when you, when you're, when your family's struggling that much financially and emotionally and with addiction issues, you get this kind of push pull, like, you know, you want to get out, but at the same time, is it going to be hard when I leave? Because mm -hmm. in some way you're the thing that kind of keeps things going, that dysfunction moving. Mm -hmm. So I didn't realize how much baggage that I was carrying with me. And I think that had a lot to do with why I was so quick to un mm -hmm. unleash on a dude. Mm -hmm. If he came mm -hmm. at me raw, because I was compartmentalizing a lot of that pain. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, that, that's how I, that, that's what I was carrying with me. And that's what I rolled up in Hamilton, New York with. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you come up there with that rage. No, it's <laughs> like, <laughs> Now tell tell us about what the transition and what the experience like was for you. Like give us a sense of what coming out of DC, coming out of military, coming out of the family. How many are you? You have any siblings? Let me ask that first. Is it just you? I have, I have you step have... I have step brothers and sisters. My dad was married before. Okay. I, I, I didn't grow up with them. They were actually grew up in San Diego. Uh, oh, and wow. I was in DC. Yeah, which is funny, full circle. So I oh. came up to I, so I came up to Colgate, I guess maybe much like a lot of y'all. I mean, I, it was like I was on another planet. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like, I was like John Glenn and Astronaut. You know? <laughs> right, right. right. Um, uh, so, you know, I showed up and, you know, again, I hate to be too raw, but I didn't have any white friends. I didn't. In high school? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I knew. Yeah, yeah. I knew and I what was the didn't. demographics of the high school? Uh, I mean, I don't specifically, you know, I wish I would have gone back and looked at that. I mean, it was, it, it seemed pretty divert, I guess, but I just did, I, you know, I just hung out on, in my bubble. I was friends mm -hmm. with cats, friendly, but not friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But so I didn't, <clears throat> and the basketball team was predominantly, you know, uh, kids of color. So, uh, so I get up to Colgate and I hadn't really, you know, hung around too many. So I'm like, and then, you know, much like y'all, maybe depending on where you grow up, you go into a new new environment, new neighborhood, you're trying to feel things out, right? You look at <laughs> you fall back a little bit to assess situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, it's yeah. it's a, it's a it's a safety mechanism that you're right, survival right, right. mechanism. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and not that, that we were ever in a harm's way, but you got cats coming in from all, you know, and so either way, I, you know, I rolled up there. I was excited, man. It was look green hills and lakes and trees and just excited to get out of my environment and so um i went in there with a really open mind and really super excited and i thought that my world was going to change so <clears throat> in that way my mindset going into it was pretty good i was excited to start the journey mm -hmm. Hmm. so when you look at it look at your time um what did you accomplish what are some of the things you're proud of personally academically athletically uh, what are some of the things you're proud of? 
at Colgate when the whole my the whole the whole time I was there. Correct. Overall, yeah, yeah. What what are highlights for you? Yeah, my biggest my biggest regret is academically. Because I didn't, I mean, I, I didn't engage at all. I think Colgate would be embarrassed if they know the level of effort that I put into my academics here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I never, I, I barely went to class. My wife, who's a Colgate grad, still teases me. There were semesters I didn't even buy books. <laughs> and I would say, and I think I was bragging. This, Yo. is, this is how young, this is how young I am. Oh, <laughs> I'd say to people, I ain't going to read them. So why would I buy them? And financial, I, and I, smart financial decision. <laughs> and I, I'm putting that out on front street. Like that's something to brag about. Wow. But the thing is, when I peel back the onion, it, what it was, was insecurity. When I got in class early freshman year, it was pretty, it was pretty clear that in a lot of cases, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> These cats are talking about stuff that I hadn't been exposed to. Right. I felt deficient. I felt it inadequate. And instead of leaning in, and, and figuring it out, I retreated. Hmm. What's your major? Telling, what was your major? Uh, sociology, anthropology. Gotcha. So, so that so that was my biggest regret. I mean, I was just excited that I graduated. So, um, so the other part B on that, fellas, is we had some professors there in sociology that I thought that there were some good classes, mm -hmm. and I wish I could go back and do a redo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm for some discussion and I, but um so that that was my biggest regret i'd say academically i just i didn't i didn't engage gotcha, at gotcha. All. um i mean to your point about not being prepared i think that's the experience of many of us coming on campus um in terms of the rigor in terms of the practice of what it takes to be successful academically we're not exposed to many of us are not exposed to that in high school and um i look back I think that's where mentorship and the institution, you know, is responsible for that. And sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't, but um, that's how a lot of us got through. Cause I know I got there and I remember I took a calculus class for like the first two months. I just looked at it as extra sleep because I realized that I can't compete in this class. And so I would just come there, just sleep in the back of the class, bro. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. Um, um, although you started with 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 regret, and I, and I appreciate you know the, the transparency with that. Um, you definitely had some successes. You know, you had to have some milestones that you reference uh, when you think of the Colgate experience for yourself. Uh, we'd love to hear from your perspective what what some of those may be. You know, uh, want to hear and I and I know a little bit about your your athletic experience as well. So please, you know, share 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 some of that because I think that's a a big a big a big factor for a lot of uh, uh, students of color. You know, looking at Colgate as a potential university, especially if they're a student athlete and thinking about what that experience might be like versus what it is and you know talk about yeah it. yeah so i mean yeah certainly my 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 the, the totality of my colgate experience is positive right I, I mean i i had a great time and it is what it is you know personally i just wish i would have engaged more in terms of highlights i mean i learned a lot about about what was possible i mean the social part was just as just as awesome i mean i you know when you had cats you know, um, I remember uh, just you guys are taking me to this place. I remember freshman year moving into my dorm and, you know, dad drove up in this beat up Buick, right? You know, got some rust on the side, missing a hubcap. <laughs> 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 and and uh, <clears throat> Emily's driving up in BMWs and sobs. <laughs> sobs. You know, remember that back in the day? Yeah, and, I remember that back in the day. And then I clear, even then I'm like, I was able to discern, oh, okay yeah that's not that's a little different <laughs> and that wasn't necessarily good or bad it just is i mean but there were conversations like people talking about the hamptons and going skiing and aspen and and just having conversations that we weren't having in my you know opportunity or hearing what people's moms and dads did for occupations mm -hmm. or hearing cats talk about grad school or the job that was waiting for them when they graduated as a junior exec making two hundred thousand dollars a year yeah, it was, you know, a lot of that stuff, you know, um, was interesting. And then I think for the work that I do now, one of the things that I learned is, you know, being able to, to, I don't want to say be a chameleon, but be able to blend hmm. and have conversations 
in different, <clears throat> I want to call it, I don't want to make it about race, just being able to nuance my way through life, mm -hmm. whether it was hanging out on the block or hanging out with a cat who grew up, you know, in, in Westchester and, and family was country cup people. And so I, I learned a lot about myself that way. Um, and then athletically, I would say, you know, I learned a lot about myself in terms of, you know, what was possible. I mean, my coach got fired after my sophomore year, Joe Baker. Uh, yeah, the, I remember that. The, yeah, so the team didn't have a winning culture at all. Uh, I had a very losing attitude. And so, uh, you know, I hung out with Jay Armstrong. I don't know if you remember that name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah Jay. Remember Jay? Yeah, so we were hanging out. And so, you know, I had some highlights, you know, you know, wins and losses, not so much. Individually, I had some good games. Learned a lot about myself along the way and made some good friends along the way. And it was just part of the collective journey, I think. Uh, you know, it kind of showed me who, what was possible. And as I look back now with new eyes, it, it kind of fed into the work that I'm doing now really a great deal and helping other people start to believe in themselves. So I look back at the totality, it was more highs and lows, fellas. Um, but I do think there was, I didn't realize how much self-doubt that I was carrying with me when you feel like you're not good enough or worthy enough or you don't fit in. And I think a lot of kids of color to go to college, whether it's in Hamilton, New York, or wherever you go, when you look around and there's not a lot of people like you, I mean, you notice, you uh -huh. see it. And you're trying to assimilate as best you can. If you assimilate too much, then sometimes you're a sellout, uh -huh. right? You know, and it's just, just an interesting dynamics that, that people don't realize we have to go through sometimes, right? You know, the yeah. gauntlet yeah. that yeah. people don't, other people don't carry that with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brother, we're going to put a pin on right there and take a pause, give some shout out to our sponsor, and we'll come right back and finish up this conversation and hear more about your journey of where you are right now. So this episode is sponsored by Hope Murals. Hope Murals is a nonprofit that provides adolescent youth with an interactive experience of creative expression via an urban arts platform that stimulates both mental and physical development. Please visit their website at www.hopemurals.org to learn more and find ways you can support the work they do. Welcome back. Welcome back. Fascinating. Learning a lot about my classmate uh, in this conversation already. So, but before we jump back in, let me thank our sponsor, Hope Murals. We greatly appreciate all that you do. You are continue to expand this exposure of urban arts to our young youth, helping them become better people. I'm excited to see the growth. So if you haven't been keeping up to speed, make sure you check out hopemurals.org, find out who they are, what they're about, check out their social media as well. Also want to give some shouts to our, our network, the Defy Life Network. Check them out at www.godefylife.com. You can find interesting, empowering, relevant written content. Make sure you shout them out. Also check out their um, podcast hub. So you can check out defylifepods.com. You can find more episodes about Aftergate as well as all the other episodes and uh, podcast shows that they got going on. We are just for the record, we are climbing up those network charts. We are officially the third most popular listened to show on that network. So okay. continue to show us some love. We are on all of your favorite podcast streaming services from Apple Pods to Spreaker to Spotify to iHeart.com. So show us some love and also cop some of the Defy Life gear because Aftergate got hoodies. We got t-shirts. Yo, show us some love on DefyLifeGear.com. On that note, Let's get back into this conversation. So Devin, welcome back, brother. And um, before we get into who you are and who you've been and how you got to be who you are, we always like to get a, a sense um, of our uh, guests, some of their thoughts, their opinions um, from where they're coming from on a particular issue. Man, one of the things I wanna hear you talk about right now is this is just a lot of things going on in the world right now from the Ukraine war to COVID stress relief, um, stress that's going on in terms of the people might be dealing with loss, people might be dealing with sickness, people might be dealing with anti-vax stuff, vax stuff. 
it's just crazy. Um, from a human resource perspective and a professional environment, you got the great resignation of people like myself leaving a job, going on to another job, <laughs> starting a new job. Uh, but it's a great thing from sitting in my seat. So love to hear just from your perspective, like what is it like out there? And then more importantly, how we can kind of get better and see the world differently. So love to hear you talk a little bit about that, bro. Yeah, so I mean, the work I do now, I mean, I, well, I'll step back a second. So I graduated from Colgate. Um, you don't know what you don't know, right? So I, I got a traditional job, kind of, sort of, right? I, uh, I went out and interviewed, had a sociology degree, I did no internships, by the way. No one thought told me that that was appropriate. Uh, you know, <laughs> the, the, the career center might as well <laughs> not even existed. Just I went back to, right, I went back to D.C. <laughs> trying to figure out, got to pay the bills. Didn't want to move into my house because I told you a little bit what was going on at the in the home team. Um, and so it, I ended up getting, I mean, I had like 30 jobs. I mean, I cleaned offices at night. I was a temp trying to figure out, you know, what was going on. So, you know, I did that for a while. I got a job, was paying the bills. That was all good stuff. F fortunately, spending up most of my career in two industries, high tech and biotech. It's a whole long story how I ended up there, but I ended up there making a little money, doing okay. And then, uh, and then fast forward to what I'm doing now. But to answer your question about the heaviness, the point of that is, is I hadn't, I mean, in, in my existence on this planet, there's just a, a collective angst right now. A lot of un people uncertain. A lot of heaviness. If you look at the data right now on kids, the social anxiety among kids is the highest in the last 50, 60 years. The suicide rate's up. Mm. Loneliness is up. Divorce is up. Substance abuse is up. Everything is up because people are struggling. And so, you know, my mission started 10 years ago was could I take my, my story? You know, what was going to be my purpose on earth? Was I going to be a giver or a taker? Is it just about consumption? Is that it? I mean, is anybody going to care about the size of my house or my bank account or about what's on the back of my jeans or any of that stuff? Or is it going to be about the impact I make? So it was a decision I made like 10, 11 years ago that I was going to take all of it and be a beacon to let other people know what's possible. And so I started doing that. I started speaking and sharing my story and telling people, hey, this is, this is who I am and this is what's possible. At the same time, Fellas, I, I landed on the tenets of positive psychology. And positive psychology essentially is that unlike, unlike traditional psychologists which study what isn't, mm -hmm. positive psychology studies what is. And so I took that science, dove real deep into it and started learning that there's actually a science of happiness. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've been using to go out and build my career around it. You can actually give people and kids and staff and some science-based tools on how to be a better version of themselves. And that's what I've been doing now. And um, it's amazing. It's been a great ride. And so I don't know if I answered the question now or not, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people. So I'm using my story, my tools, my resources as a, to empower other people to believe that's, that's my mission. Bruh, I'm a big believer in optimism. I'm a big believer in hope and perspective and energy and joy. And um, I, I greatly appreciate the phrases that you put out on LinkedIn. And I like to share when people touch people, even though they don't, they might not know the impact that they're having. And I think that's to your point is that's the reason we need to do this more often because we have no clue of the impact that we're having amongst the world. And so I just wanna share that those, those um, quotes, those thoughts, um, not only do I like them, but I then take them and then share them with my family, you know, because I want to continue to be a positive energy. And I use, what, I use you as a tool, honestly, you know what I mean? I take what you are sending out to the world and repurpose and continue to spread it and forward it. And so just want to thank you and let you know it is, it's having an impact. It's helping. So keep doing and, what you're doing. For, for our listeners, the, the, the messaging that, that Alvin's referring to uh, comes out of a D Hughes, the daily dose that uh, is, if you sign up and get on his uh, newsletter and database, you, 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 you'll be the beneficiary of those motivational quotes and, and to, just to echo everything that Glimpse said, I'm gonna keep it short, ditto. Uh, it has become, it has been a tremendous resource for me personally. 
Um, but I've been able to share with those in my network, family and friends that I know, particularly sometimes details about what's going on in their life and how their words are uh, relative to helping them, you know, navigate through that. So uh, you are a man of uh, your word and, you know, in terms of acknowledging the heaviness, wanting to be a role and inspiration in addressing it and addressing it with people you don't even know. That's, that's the beauty of it. So. so. So what's fascinating, fellas, about this conversation is like 10 years ago, I gave a talk. I just volunteered. Like I was, I was at a point in my career where I didn't want to do what I, I thought, I thought like there was more gas in the tank. You know, I had the corporate job and I had, you know, I'd done all that stuff. And then I was like trying to figure out who I could be. Like what, what's the night, you know, um, you know, occasionally on your computer, you have to reboot the operating system, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but you don't throw the computer away. And I was like, oh, I need a reboot. Like mm -hmm. what's next? Uh, and so I looked around and I was like, you know what? I, I want to be, I want to speak for a living. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? Yeah, yeah. I'm a, I, I think that I'm going to go out and, and tell my story. I'm going to build a career around that. So make a long story short, I started volunteering at Kiwanis's and Rotaries. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I was like looking at people who was doing what I was doing, but like, you know, you don't just show up in prime time. So I started refining my craft like a comedian would. Mm -hmm. Make a long story short, I, I forgot where it was. I was in Chicago giving a free talk that I funded myself. And I was, I was putting into it. I, I might've been, man, it felt like church in that joint. I mean, I was sweating. I was going into it. I was <laughs> leaning into my story hard. Unbeknownst to me, there was a publisher in the back of the room who caught me on the way out and said, wow. I didn't know looking at you, I wouldn't have thought that mm. that was a pivotal moment for me because at that moment, that publisher helped me publish my first book, mm. which is where I unpacked my story to the world. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I could be an author. I didn't, I, didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't come out of the room thinking that I could write, but I had someone believe in me mm -hmm. before I could believe in myself. Mm. Mm. That's powerful. Right. And so I've used that as a catalyst to, to empower other people. And so what I'm trying to do is you cannot pour from an empty cup. You cannot give what you do not have. So I'm, my mission is to pour in other people's cups. I'm not competing. I'm collaborating. There's enough out here for all of us. Mm -hmm. And so when you see these daily doses and notes, at first, that was just me. That was me like taking my vitamin C every day because I realized that I'm a better version of me when I feel good. Mm -hmm. when I'm positive. I'm optimistic. It's a superpower, mm -hmm. right? If I say to people and y'all, do you think you perform better when you feel better? You're like, yeah. Am I at my best when I feel my best? Yeah. So if that's the case, then why aren't I more intentional about my my well being? Amen. And so what I what I thought, and I, I use this funny, and y'all might laugh. I have happiness hygiene every single day. Mm -hmm. I'm working on me upstairs. I don't discount it for any brother or sister in the world. I'm going to be the best version of me. And that was the catalyst for the daily dose. I started working on me. And then what happened is other people were like, oh, I need that too. And I'm like, oh, it's not just me. And then that spiraled. And then things just went viral like that. And that was the catalyst for the writing and the sharing of all of that. It wasn't this yeah. master plan where I was in a room like with some just, you know, doing some strategery. <laughs> it was just me getting vulnerable. And then next thing you know, it blew up. That's dope. Mm -hmm. um, so is there, you kind of walk through your journey. Um, is there any aspect of when you left Colgate to where you are now that you want to raise up that you might not have mentioned? Because, I mean, you as you answer an initial question, you did reference it, but definitely would love to give you an opportunity if there is any aspect of it that you omitted. Because we'd love to hear how you got from Colgate to now and to tap. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, I mean, there was, you know, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to necessarily, we need to unpack it, but we had the three of us had an experience that summer that was a little bit alarming. It was, it when was, some, and it has been referenced on the show. So, um, not in, you know, name, but that was something that, you know, we was share relevant, was relevant <laughs> to our, our, our transition <laughs> orientation. To COVID, that was yeah. something yeah. we share. And traumatic. Yeah. It was traumatic. Yeah. So I don't necessarily need to unpack it, but, you know, one of the fellows was my roommate. And so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, at that point, again, it made me the power of choice. That the choices we make have a mm -hmm. huge impact mm -hmm. 
And, and so I started thinking more, you know, instead of the short game, the long game. And so again, as I navigated my career, I felt I must have had 35 jobs after Colgate. I mean, I worked from rental car to cleaning office buildings, to being a temp, to working on sheds. I mean, I did everything. And what happened is you go into a job and you settle, you lower expectations because you don't know what you don't know. You're underprepared. You haven't done any internships. You're embarrassed about your GPA. At least I was. Whenever they asked for it, it was like, um. <laughs> y'all, y'all, really, y'all, y'all really need that? Is that a requirement? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, really, it was like, oh, okay. So maybe, you know, and, and so, you know, it's funny, I, I, Lo and behold, I was living with a, a fellow in Washington, D.C., and, and this is crazy, but he had a sales job. And he had a sales job selling peat moss. <laughs> peat moss for your garden or for your farm. I don't even know what peat moss is. I know it's agricultural, okay? Uh, but I, I know this. He was working from home, and he had a company car. I was like, oh, snap. <laughs> Okay. So I was like, maybe the sales thing is what I need to get into. Right. And it's kind of competitive. Like they give you a quota. They give you a quota. And if you do better, you get paid more. Oh, so I mean, I can channel some of the athleticism into this. I cannot work a dude. And it's competitive and we got a scoreboard. And so that was my pivot into sales. And I did that for a long time in my career and had done really well. I think a byproduct of that was one, I was competitive. And two, learning how to navigate the social scene at Colgate, being able to have different conversations with a lot of different cats from a lot of different groups served me well mm-hmm. in my career. Mm-hmm. Good, stuff, good stuff, good stuff. So when you think about your time at Colgate and what you are doing now, is there anything you wish you had done more of, less of, learned, experienced, in terms of what you are doing right now? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, beyond the academic part, there was a lot of resources. I mean, like, I never went to any arts, any plays, never went to any talks. I mean, I just, I didn't, I didn't appreciate the depth and breadth of the experience there. It was either on a court or social. It was one, those are the polarities. I was either downtown gym <laughs> right. there was no in between an occasional class <laughs> yes. very and occasional <laughs> and, and occasionally walking up the hill in that freezing weather to go to class to yeah. feel like you weren't good oh. enough to feel you weren't good enough yeah. Well, yeah where'd you live on campus what were your uh do you remember like yeah you so in four years yeah so freshman year i lived in east hall okay so i was right on the hill uh sophomore they, year they knew in- not to put you down the hill <laughs> we gonna give him a head start and put him on east hall right there <laughs> yes yeah, so i lived in i lived in east hall with a fellow from texas uh and then sophomore year i lived in kdr oh okay i was in a fraternity you know, a bunch of basketball and football fellas uh remember tony horn and mm-hmm. yep, yep. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. tk mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. george sanker and a bunch of other mm-hmm. fellows and then all the hoop guys and then junior year i lived off campus Junior, yeah, both junior and senior, I lived off campus in a house. Okay. In, a, in a private house? Yeah. Okay. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, so we also like to get perspective from our guests and get a sense of um, what would you tell Devin if you could when he was entering, uh, 18-year-old Devin, when he was entering Colgate? And then also, what would you tell Devin, 22, when he's graduated Colgate? Yeah, so 18, I wish someone would have whispered in my ear and said, hey, you, you're good enough. You're going to be okay. You're, you're worthy. worthy. You should be here. You should be here, but it ain't going to be easy, buddy. It's, it's going to be a grind. You have to lean in a little bit. It's going to be uncomfortable, but I'm, I don't need you to step back. I need you to lean forward. I need you to ask for help. It's not weakness to not know. It's okay to go to get some resources. You're not going to be the smartest cat in every class. In some cases, you're not going to know what you don't know. Mm-hmm. I wish someone would have just maybe gave me the little bit of heads up how hard I'm, the uncomfortables I might feel, and then make it okay or normal. That it would, yeah, normalize it. Because what happens is, is sometimes when you go through that adversity, you make it a, make it about you that you're not worthy or you're not mm-hmm. capable. Like there's something wrong with you. 
Like you personalize it, at least I did. Mm -hmm. And that's hard for an 18 year old cat to get his arms around, which is why I think I didn't, I didn't go to class because it was my way of kind of, I thought saving myself from that shame of putting the mirror up, knowing that I'm not, I'm not capable. Now keep in mind, I didn't even talk about this fellas. I mean, I should have, I don't know why. I'm also dyslexic. Hmm. Yeah, people don't know that. And I didn't tell people that. See, I didn't even tell y'all. I mean, I couldn't read till I was in the fifth grade. I was in special ed. So a byproduct of that is I had a lot of baggage academically already. I was getting help after school. And so, you know, if I wrote a paragraph, I would repeat words. And so everything took me longer to create. And so now I'm at another level in Colgate, wow. not feeling like I'm worthy and then being dyslexic and not sharing that with anybody. Cause then I thought I was either farther less than that I was, I mean, I, I'll just say this. I don't think people realize how much baggage sometimes you bring with you. And that was one of the things that brought with me. So I guess the answer question, that's what I would probably, Mm -hmm. you know I would do you talked about mentorship Alvin yeah it would be nice if they had mentored us up with somebody mm -hmm. and like I had a cat who looked like me or came from where I came and it could have held me a little bit accountable now in terms of 22 um uh, what would I say to myself I, I I probably would have said to myself that uh um I would have congratulated myself number one you it was a big deal that you graduated uh and number two I would have done a retrospective probably. And what are the lessons learned? Kind of what we're doing here today. What you learn about yourself? What do you want to be? What do you want to do? I had really short-term thinking. Mm. I, you know, and, and maybe that's maybe that's survival, but I wish I could have got started a lot quicker doing the things I really wanted to do. And I think in a lot of cases I settled. I continued to lower expectations about myself, about what was possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, it would have been nice if I had someone whisper in my ear that, you know, you can do big things. But that wasn't the conversations I was having with myself at the time. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, we are at that point where uh, we really love the opportunity for guests to share, um, you know, sort of what they're doing, how others can connect with them, how what products or services they might offer. If there are any events coming up on your on your calendar that you want to use this platform for what it is created to be, which is a networking platform, which is a way to raise awareness about uh, what you bring to the table that we already know is a need out there. And, and folks may not know that uh, there are opportunities to collaborate and connect the dots. And so uh, please uh, don't hold back. You know, you have a lot going on, but, but how can folks reach you and, and what would you, you know, what would they be looking for in their efforts to reach out? What do you bring to the table? Yeah. So you can find me, my website is, devinchughes.com. I'm all over social media. You certainly can find me there. I mean, most of my work right now, most of my work is in two, two sandboxes. I do a lot of corporate work around uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, but how do you actually bring folks together to create an inclusive culture where human beings feel like they can thrive and be the best version of themselves? Now, I come at it a little bit different. I actually operationalize it, meaning there's a lot of people that we know that have a diverse group and being inclusive, but I give people tools. How do you actually empower people to have conversations? Mm -hmm. Bes besides celebrating Kwanzaa or Black History Month, that this kind of performance activism where a couple times a year we act like we care, mm -hmm. but day to day I walk by you in the hall and I don't acknowledge you. Um, so, I, so I do a lot of work on workplace culture and I also do that in, with, in a lot of school systems. I do a lot of work with staff and teachers because uh, teachers right now are getting, as you know, it's really, really tough in the school system. So I do a lot of work with administrators, teachers around well-being, giving them some science-based tools that they can start to fill their own cup. Because you can't pour into students what you don't have. So I do a lot of work with staff, so around engagement. And then I do some motivational speaking. I do a lot of work with schools, just, you know, there's a lot of Devons running around, a lot of, you know, Folks like y'all, like us, who are trying to figure out who they could be. And I just kind of unpack my story. You know, you got a special ed kid from a, bi, you know, who's biracial with addiction issues, ends up writing 21 books and has been to 17 countries and travels the globe and spoken at multiple universities in front of people who barely graduated college. How does that happen? Mm. That's the story that I lean into a lot, too. Appreciate that. Uh, after Gate Folk, show some love. Make sure you 
get on the website, follow him on social medias. Um, this is what this Aftergate journey movement is all about. Um, any final words before we close out? Yeah, I think uh, my final words would be, and this is kind of the theme for my life right now, progress, not perfection. Mm, yes, that's what it's about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what it's about. You know, uh, nothing wrong with failing forward, right? It's about just learning from your mistakes. So, and um, man, this has been awesome, bro. Um, I've, you know, it's uh, amazing. We spent four years on a college campus and I, I just learned so much about you in the last hour or so. So I appreciate you being on our show. I appreciate you being a guest. Appreciate what you're doing for this universe so continue being you and doing what you're doing and again like i said like jerry said we are out here we're listening and sharing so um, you're reaching folks that you are not even aware that you're reaching so keep doing what you do um this has been another episode of aftergate season two so again thanks to our guests thanks to our listeners appreciate y'all um we are powered by the defy life network so make sure you check us out in the future we got a lot of even more dope podcasts coming down the pipeline. So keep showing the love, more dope episodes to follow. Peace. Yes, sir. You hear that? Listen closer. That, my friend, is the deafening sound of focus. It drowns out all the useless noise that can clutter the moment. Naysayers don't exist. Haters, smaters, the peanut gallery. Who's that? When you're in your zone, all that noise and all that buzz is just elevator music. So, enjoy your journey, focus on your goal, and bask in the quiet roar that is progress. Because when it's your time to shoot that shot, spit that verse, or close that deal, the only voice that matters is yours. The Fire Life. <laughs>